I'm Dr. Chris Bergwald. I'm Father Scott Trainer, And we want to welcome you to this study that we are doing, video series on the book, From Christendom to Apostolic Mission, Pastoral Strategies for an Apostolic Age. So, Father, as we're getting into the book, why are we doing this? Well, yeah, it's remarkable. So, you know, uh, Bishop DeGrood has sent copies of this book to every pastor and parish staff and all the employees of our Catholic schools. Because this book really gives a understanding of our current cultural situation, which needs to inform how we're trying to reach people through the ministries of our schools and parishes and Catholic groups. Uh, we're living in a different cultural situation than we were 100 years ago mm -hmm. or even 50 years ago. And the way that we uh, reach out to people needs to be targeted for a new cultural situation. So this book really gives a beautiful and... Um, Boy, uh, clear, in-depth, but really accessible understanding of the where we're at in our current cultural situation compared to history, to understand why Bishop's initiative, uh, the vision that he's placed in front of the diocese of lifelong Catholic missionary discipleship through God's love, is such an important and targeted response to our present cultural situation. Yes. Yeah, so I, I, when, when Bishop proposed this and I read the book uh, and we're going to get into the content pretty quickly here, I was very excited because it just gets at that point. It, it, it's like lightning in a bottle where it names the fact that we need to shift our approach to correspond to the new situation that we're, we're living in. Would you say that that kind of summarizes it? Right on. So many people have heard the discouraging, you know, uh, sociological studies yep. of church attendance and mass attendance and belief in basic Catholic doctrines and all these things. And it's just kind of like a, a downward <laughs> trend uh -huh. of decline, right? right? And the point is that we can look at that and say, oh, just be discouraged. And if we keep trying to do the same things the same way, we're going to get the same results. But actually, there's a tremendous opportunity to understand that the cultural ground has shifted and invites new approaches, and to have a real confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the gifts that God is raising up in individuals and communities of our faith to really respond to the present situation. Amen. But that's going to look a little different. Amen. It's going to look different. We're going to have to adapt differently. And later on in the chapters, we're going to touch on the need to have that joy uh, to engage with the culture. Amen. But let's start, Father, with the introduction. Um, so basically, my summary of the introduction is that we are living in a change of ages in which the church's responsibility to adapt to cultural realities is all the more urgent. You just sort of touched on this in essence. There's there's a shift in, in the cultural ground on which we stand, and the church always has to adapt to the time and places in which she finds herself. She can't keep doing the same things the same way she always has, especially when there's an epical change. Amen. Uh, one of the things that uh, the book points out, it's a quote from C.S. Lewis that uh, first of all, that this is the first time in church history that we're living in a culture that was once Christianized, like uh, Christianized, right, and is now like been resecularized, right. Post That's a new situation that right. the Amen. church hasn't faced in two thousand years. Ever, it started within a pagan secular culture and needed to evangelize that culture, but then in the Western civilization, we've enjoyed Christendom for many, many centuries. So this is a new situation where we're uh, trying to re-evangelize a culture that was once Christian and now has become secular. And there's a real difference. He uh, uses this image from C.S. Lewis. There's a real difference if a man is trying to court a woman, like to woo a maiden to marriage versus trying to win back an estranged spouse after divorce. Right. Those are two very different endeavors, and that helps capture the sense like, yeah, we need a new approach for a new situation. Right. It's uh, You and I have both used the idea of an inoculation, where mm -hmm. um, I, our Christianity in the West now, not Christianity, in the West, we have sort of a weakened sense of the full Christian gospel, mm -hmm. and that's sort of deadened our, our sensitivity to the full power of the gospel. So we, as the church, need to recognize that that people have heard of Jesus Christ, heard of the Catholic Church, and they're eh, not really interested, thank you very much, mm -hmm. which is much more, as you said, the, the image from Lewis, that's a lot harder to win back uh, the, the, uh, what's, what's someone the who's been there and did that. Yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. Then somebody who's never heard of this before. Right. It's like when you have a plot of ground that's empty versus one where there's a decrepit house that you have to clear away first. Right. The demo has to be done before you can rebuild. That's right. That's right. Um, the author mentions that the, the primary challenge of our times, like it isn't just to repeat 
or repeat more, I don't know, with clarity and um, vigor, the doctrinal content of our faith right. and the moral teachings of our faith. The reason that, because those are clear, we've never actually been in an age where it's more readily accessible to know what the church teaches right. and why. Like that's right. readily available. But why is that that teaching and proclamation oftentimes like water off a duck's back? It's because people do not have this overarching view of reality. What's important about life? What does it mean to live a good life? What is my life all about? Who is God? What is the world? Who am I? What's my relationship to God in the world? In a Christendom culture, uh, they were those basic foundational world vision ideas were shared broadly and commonly, but that's not the case today. Right. And so, uh, just repeating the doctrine and moral teaching of the church is not going to be compelling to a lot of people today. So we need to do work to recover a conversion of a mindset, yep. which isn't an academic exercise, but it's really informing the imagination of like, yeah, what is the grand narrative of my life all about? Amen. So that kind of gets us into chapter one, which is titled The Place of a Ruling Imaginative Vision in Human Cultures. And there's a primary subheading subsection within chapter, Christendom and the Apostolic Modes of Engagement. So basically, um, my summary of this chapter, the, the author is just laying out the fact that as you were just touching on, um, there is a reality of, of, a, of a governing vision um, an imaginative vision, what some would call a worldview that all of us have. Every person has this, and every culture ha has this. And, 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 and sort of the fundamental point of the book in terms of starting points is we have to recognize that Christendom is no longer the dom— so Christianity, rather. Christianity is no longer the dominant influence that it was once was in the West. Uh, that's what a Christendom culture is, where Christianity is the dominant culture— Christianity is still an influence, but it's not the defining influence that it once was. So now we all live, uh, the, the point of the, this chapter, uh, we all live by a vision or a narrative of reality that guides our actions. Right. We every, And every person has this. And it's not like I have to sit down for like a month on end and say, okay, what's my right. ruling imaginative vision of the world? It's just what we kind of learn and often uncritically accept because of the air that we breathe. It's just the culture that we live in. And again, in centuries of a Christendom culture, those things tend to lead a person to Christ and the church. Like, uh, it's not just religion, but it is a commonly accepted moral code. Like, what's right and wrong? What's yep. good and evil? Uh, what does it mean to be a good person? What does that look like? That looks different in a, from a Christendom mindset or a Christianity ruling imaginative vision than it does from a secular or a secular progressive ruling imaginative vision. Uh, what are the clear categories of success and failure? What are my economic and political values and practices? How is that expressed in our legal codes and our public policy? Uh, what qualifies as good manners and you know what kind of modes of entertainment do we engage in? All of those things are part of the air that we breathe that shape that ruling imaginative vision in the heart of every person. And therefore, so, so once we recognize what that imaginative vision is, it requires us as the church to adapt to that. So chapter one, the author lays out these three different uh, contexts in which the gospel is proclaimed. Yeah, so this is just taken from uh, the Acts of the Apostles. And I, I think it's a great point that illustrates how the proclamation of the gospel will, will be received depending on what the ruling imaginative vision of the group of people is. So first of all, there's Peter preaching to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. Right. And 3,000 people are converted that day. How was such a remarkable response to the proclamation of Jesus Christ even possible? It was only possible because those first Christians, the disciples of Jesus Christ, shared so much in common in terms of a ruling imaginative vision with the Jewish people, that there is a God, that God is laboring for the salvation of the world, that we await a Messiah to restore all people to God. And so really the proclamation was Jesus Christ is the Messiah that we've all been waiting for within this vision of God and the world and ourselves in relationship with God that we all share in common. So there was a ready and a very broad response for that right, uh, right. audience. Right. For that audience. Secondly, later on in Acts of the Apostles, Paul and Barnabas are in Lystra. There is a community of people who were in the Greek uh in the yeah, in the Greek um mythology of the pantheon of the gods, right? right? So when they, uh, uh, in Jesus' name, perform this miracle uh, of, I think, healing a crippled man, 
uh, the people respond, not proclaiming faith in Jesus Christ, but believing that Paul and Barnabas are Zeus and Hermes. And right, right. So they interpret the sign of divine power as within their worldview. Oh, this is Zeus and Hermes. And Paul is like, no, 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 no. We're just men like you. This man is healed in the name of Jesus Christ. So there's a response, but it's not a response of faith in Jesus Christ. It's a response that needs to be a deeper conversion to understand a whole worldview where this power and grace of Jesus Christ comes from. So it's a much different project than the Jews who just come to believe in Jesus at Pentecost. Right. And third? Finally, there's Paul at the Areopagus. Uh, And there is a ruling imaginative vision from the Greek philosophical tradition. So when Paul starts speaking uh, about the resurrection— they're like, oh, that's very interesting. We'd like to hear about that some more. Like, oh, that's, that's a good uh, conversation. Tell me, uh, we'll catch talk you about later. This and some people are scornful, <laughs> right. you know, uh, and very few people come to faith. And again, in all three cases, it's the same proclamation of Jesus Christ, but it lands and is received very differently because of three very different worldviews ruling imaginative visions of those communities. Right. So I think the, the the introduction, chapter one, are really key to understand. And what we've done in the study guide is offer some some questions, some ideas on how to put these uh, the, the, the ideas of these chapters into action. Perfect. And that will wrap up this, this first video, and we'll see you shortly in number two.